make some adjustments, standing, seated, lying down, whatever posture is most supportive for you and your practice today. We'll practice in stillness for about 30 minutes. Taking the opportunity, well, let's start the perfect. Taking the opportunity to really tune in to this body, heart, mind, to discern right here, right now, what posture would be most supportive for your practice of presence, cultivation of awareness, of ease, and wakefulness. Comfortable, but not so comfortable that you're going to fall asleep. And alert, but not so alert that you're tense in any way. If sitting on a zafu, it can be nice to bring yourself to the front of the zafu so you're just using the front third. And sometimes that can be helpful on a chair as well. But for some of us, the support of the back of the chair is helpful. We want the back to be long and strong, straight. Lying down as well, have the back be long and strong. The chest open, the ribcage open. The diaphragm, the belly free of any constraints. So if you've got a belt on or anything like that, it can be nice to loosen it. Opening the shoulders, lengthening the crown of the head. Using whatever prop might be available for you, pull the blanket under your feet, or something behind your back, or something to lift your hip. So that you've got about a 90 degree, or maybe a little bit more angle at the knee, and a 90 degree, or maybe a little bit more bend at the hips that supports the low back. If it's tighter than 90, there's compression that happens, there's kind of a concaving that's not very supportive for the body or for the practice. And we root down into the stability of the earth, grounding down into our mountainness and our earthness, feeling that foundation. And we lift up out of that solidity and stability, lengthening the spine, the crown of the head reaching toward the sky, whether that is up or out. We feel that length. And then broadening the shoulders, we feel that breath. And we take up our space in this time and place in the crust of the earth where the conditions are just so, such that we human beings have come to exist. When we rest here with openness and presence and a cultivation of ease, and maybe the song continues to loop in our minds, and that can be our object of awareness. knowing that we are blooming as a flower, that each moment we spend in the practice of mindfulness and awareness and the cultivation of presence and ease, wakefulness is blooming. Might be a bud, might be a full blossom, but it's in that process, that's what's happening because the conditions are there to support that. Nor we might be inspired to cultivate the experience of freshness so that each practice of meditation can be fresh, a new opportunity, a new moment, a new period of practice, a new minute, a new hour, a new day, new commitment, fresh, clean slate, like the morning dew, 
fresh and clean. As we continue to practice resting into the present moment, at some point in time, we'll feel a little bit more solidity, a little touch of the solidness of a mountain. We kind of feel ourselves sitting in line, standing like a mountain. Stable. Well, perhaps we're inspired to rest into and rely on the firmness of the earth. To really feel our bodies connected with this earth and the stability that she offers us. Or maybe it's the hug of gravity, that warm embrace of love and care. These conditions are so we can exist. You might touch moments of freedom. from our conditioning, this conditioned mind, the tortures of Mara, the doubt. Moments of freedom arise, clear seeing, insight. Moment of letting go. We can savor that and notice it. the moment of being gentle with ourselves or catching the critic and not believing it. Or that experience of being like clear, calm, still water reflecting things as they are. You're not adding anything, you know, free from the meaning making of the mind. Or a moment of spaciousness. And in that spaciousness, we might know that everything is okay, just as it is, far from perfect. And good enough. And we show up for ourselves. Resting into the present moment.
And maybe you have an experience of noticing, oh, I'm not present. That moment is complete presence. Like that's the gift of mindfulness returning, worthy of celebration. I invite you to explore in those moments how it feels to have mindfulness arise again, how it feels in the body, in the heart, in the gut, in the chest, in the big muscles of the legs, shoulders. Neck. To feel that experience of waking up to presence. Resting in awareness. Perhaps noticing what you are aware of or noticing that you're aware or noticing how it feels to be aware. Maybe you have a practice of resting in awareness of a particular object, the breath or sound or some other particular sensation in the body. Great. Fine. You do you, please. And if you're interested, I invite you to explore touching into this experience of being aware of being mindful. It's really true that mindfulness does not care what it is mindful of. And as we begin to practice, as we begin to practice in a broader way with awareness or mindfulness, without focus on the object of which we are aware, we come to experience that mindfulness can hold anything. Grief, joy, frustration, excitement, happiness, delight, contentment. Discomfort in the body, ease in the body. And we can begin to get curious about our heart's response. So the heart contract or expand? What's my relationship to the experience? Is there chasing after or pushing away? Is there an experience of appreciating or not liking? Playing, exploring, this is your practice.
Continuing to enjoy eyes closed. Continuing to practice mindfulness. Gradually expanding the field of awareness. Bringing movement. Feeling the body moving and moving in choice and listening in to the heart and the gut to discern how this body might want to move. It might be small movements or big movements. And then, as you're ready, again, in consciousness, inviting the eyes to open and noticing this experience of light coming in and as much sightedness as is available, noticing what arises in the field of vision and how the heart or the gut responds to it. If there's any sense of contraction or expansion of moving toward or away. When you're ready, as you're ready, for practice, your way. Noticing what you notice internally and externally. What is happening in here at the heart and the back? As you take in what's happening out there. Like they're, they're co-arising. And you might even land on an experience, on one experience in which you can feel both pleasant and unpleasant vedana or feeling tone that experience that underlies the liking or the not liking. Oh yeah, that 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 experience. Oh yep, yeah, it's both pleasant and unpleasant. Interesting. Or neither pleasant nor unpleasant. You know, somewhere in between. It's all good. We're not trying to make it some way. Good luck, right? That doesn't work. That's just torture. Or practicing to notice and to tend to what arises in the heart, tend to what arises in the gut. So that's what we can do. Like that's where we have some agency. So a lot has happened since I was last here, since I last saw you. I was last year in the summer of 2023 with plans to go on a meditation retreat, which I did. And in the midst of that, I was called to Philadelphia to be with my mom. And I spent two months with her at the last stages of her life. And I was there and she died. And then it's like all the other things that I'm there responsible for as a result of that. And then I got to go on retreat again. And so I just spent a month at Spirit Rock. And it's like, oh yeah, right. I need all of that. Like it's all part of life. And I'm sure lots has happened for you. It was summer. Summer has come and gone. Autumn has come and gone. Winter has come and it's almost gone. It certainly feels like it's gone, right? But according to the calendar, you have a couple more weeks. So lots has happened for you as well. It's what happens. If we are alive, right? Time passes and experiences arise and they pass. Seasons arise and they pass. A meditation period arises and passes, right? A day, an evening, a life. It's it's how it is. All conditioned experiences are permanent. And it's one of the characteristics, one of the marks of existence. And I invite you to reflect, eyes open, eyes closed, you know, whatever supports you. If you can separate out 
summer 2023, winter 2023, 2024, fall 2023. You know, if you can separate them out and recall your experience, or maybe that's too big of an ask. You know, there's like a, just this big pool of things, but check it out. Like summer, this past summer, June, July, August, let's say, or, you know, if you live in San Francisco, you maybe you want to include September, but like your summer, what did it entail? What was the flavor of your summer? Is there a highlight? Is there a low light? Is there some hard experience that's there? Was it pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant or unpleasant? What happens when you recall it? Is there some greed or some aversion? Or like, is there so much delusion that you're like, I have no idea. What was my summer? Or you realize that your perception of it is different from how it was in reality. So that's lots of words. Take a moment and recall your summer. And maybe there's one experience that's kind of rising to the top, or there's a bunch, or there's nothing. It's all good. Can you distill that to a word or a list of maybe five words or a very short sentence? And noticing how that feels in the body without using the mic, we'll just go around the circle, trying to be as succinct as you can. So name and pronouns, I'll model. Name and pronouns. And then your one word or list of three or five words or very short sentence for your summer. So Augusta, she, her. Quality family time. And we'll go this way and we'll stop when we get to the screen and do the screen. And then dropping in to notice how it feels to have shared, to have listened to one another. And this too can be part of our practice. It's what we do all day long. And then check in again, what happens if you move to the fall? How does it feel in the body? So there's some content that arises. Or maybe it takes a while, there's no content yet. September, October, November. And then under the content, what's happening in the body? How does the body respond to this recollection? And then we'll go counterclockwise. I'll start again, though. And take your time if you're not there yet. Heavy. And again, noticing in the body how it feels to have shared, to have listened, you know, to be a part of the Sangha, to be a part of this community that's gathering today in this moment in time. And we're here together, sharing and bearing witness to one another. And then tuning in for your own exploration. We're not going to go around this time. What about the winter or the now? January, February, March. Maybe December is in there. Highlights, low lights.
does it distill into an emotion? Can you feel a heart quality? And can that be felt in the body? And if you're inspired to share, you can popcorn it out and, and no need. I'll share for me gratitude and in the body expansion. Yeah. Thanks everyone for playing. You know, I like to bring everyone in and out and you know feel the community because I think that that is one of the underlying causes of suffering is this isolation that we experience. And we're not alone and we think we're alone and it's delusion, but we suffer from delusion, right? It's like, it's the ongoing suffering. Okay, and so we can have a moment of like feeling that separation and anxiety and like, and we could have this, this inklings of, oh yeah, you too. Oh, right, we're connected in this experience. Sangha, it's for real. It's powerful. It's healing. So I could talk about a lot of things tonight, but what I want what I was inspired to talk about as I reflected at the end of my practice this morning was something that I got from this retreat I was just on, which is from the Angutra, Angutra Nikaya, which is not a word that I say very often, which is the, I think it's numerical. Yeah, the numerical discourses. So this is from Anguttara Nikaya 9.3, and it's the Magiya Sutta. And James Baraz was one of the teachers for the February month on at Spirit Rock, as he has been maybe every February since it's existed, which is really interesting. It's very interesting that he's like been holding that space down for so long. And the team of five teachers or seven teachers varies. And it's the first time that I've been on that retreat. And In his last full evening talk, when he had a whole hour, this is one of the things that he mentioned, and it really, it touched something in me. And so I've been practicing with it. I may have shared with you in the past that part of my morning practice involves recollecting several things. And so I added this in to the end of my recollection. I said, well, yeah, I want to share about this. So the sutta has more nuance to it. I'm going to see how my time goes. I might go back into the sutta. But the five things, the five things that the Buddha offered in the Magiya Sutta, I guess I'll go into a little bit of detail. So there's this young monk, young monastic, young practitioner named Magiya. And he has the opportunity to be with Buddha. And he asked the Buddha, may I go in, to, into this town for alms rounds in the morning? I'd like to do that. And Buddha said, yes, as you see fit. And so in the morning, he puts on his appropriate clothing, he goes in and out of robe, he gets his bowl, and he goes into town for alms or alms, and he gets his alms. And then as he's coming back, he's stretching his legs, doing some walking meditation, and he sees a mango grove, and he thinks, oh, that would be such a beautiful place to practice meditation. I want to go there and practice meditation, and he's all excited. Those moments of excitement to go and practice meditation are beautiful moments, for sure. And he goes back to the Buddha, he's like, dear venerable sir, you know, he does the appropriate bowing and going down to the right side and sitting down next to him and dear venerable sir. I, I saw a mango robe that looks really ideal for practice. May I go and practice there? And Buddha says to him, mm, maybe not right now, Magia. Why don't you wait until some other monastics, some other practitioners have arrived? It's just you and me right now. But sir, dear venerable sir, you've already attained everything. You have nothing left to attain. But me, I have much to do. I really want to go and practice. That mango girl looks so appealing. But well, Mejia, it's just the two of us right now. Why don't you wait until some others have arrived? But sir, and he asks a third time, and like three is this magic number in Buddhism. 
So Buddha says, do as you see fit. Just do as you see fit. And he says, thank you, sir. And he does some more rallying. And he gets up and he goes to the mango grove. And he goes deep in the mango grove inside this beautiful tree. And he sits down underneath the tree in seclusion and gets his posture. And he's just assailed. He's assailed by sensual desire, greed. <laughs> he's assailed by ill will, aversion. And he's assailed by thoughts of doing harm. And he spends a day trying to practice, but he's assailed by these three challenges to practice. Just, just keep going. And then he goes back to the Buddha late afternoon and he says to him, you'll never believe what happened. You know, and he repeats back when I just said to you. And it was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hello. And of course, totally translating it is totally morphing at this point into my own language, which of course has been there the whole time. But basically, dude, you're new to practice. Yeah, it's how it's going to be. And here are five things that you might consider, that we all might consider, that I might consider. One who is not fully enlightened might consider. That the Buddha offers forward, that can ripen the mind. They can move the mind in the direction of liberation and freedom. And what are those five things? One, the first is Kalyana Mitta or spiritual friends or Sangha to spend time with people who are committed to this path or interested in this path or exploring this path. Like spend time with spiritual friends, cultivate those friendships. And how do we cultivate those friendships? Through vulnerability. Right? You don't develop intimacy with anyone without revealing yourself a little bit. And how do you reveal yourself? By befriending yourself. You know, by feeling comfortable enough and safe enough to feel whatever it is that's, that's going on in here. And then to have the courage to have it come out of your mouth. It's not going to happen like this. You know, it's not how it goes. And we didn't have a lot of time tonight. And it's all good. But, like, that's the first thing that the Buddha put forward. And I feel like... So as some of you know, my practice was rooted in the Plum Village tradition with which we began with, with, with which we began with that song. And then also Theravada, the student of Ajahn Chah and disciples of Ajahn Chah, and then trained at Spirit Rock. And you know, this sutta is from the Theravada lineage, from the Pali Canon. And in the Spirit Rock world, excuse me, not the Spirit Rock world, in the Plum Village world, we talk about Sangha a lot. Sangha is super important. And of course, we know it's one of the three gems, the triple jewel, Buddha Dharma Sangha. And yet there's some way that sometimes in insight or in Theravada Buddhism, there can be this focus on Buddha Dharma, Buddha Dharma, Buddha Dharma, Buddha Dharma. And yeah, Buddha Dharma is super important. Leaning toward awakening, trusting in the Buddha, yes. And the Dharma or the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, the true reality things as they are, yes. In the Sangha, the community of practitioners, we need each other to awaken. You know, we need each other to move forward. We need each other to wake up. Like that support is invaluable. And you know, those of us who are in recovery, we know this. We know that we can't work the steps alone. We know that we have to go to meetings. We have to pick up the phone and make those calls. Or you need fellowship. It's a piece of it. And the Buddha laid this out. Like, Paul Gadimitra was the first thing he said. Spiritual friends. And one who has spiritual friends has the support, the second thing, to practice with their ethical conduct. And of course, if one is to take a monastic veil, they're a lot more complicated. But for those of us who are lay practitioners, ideally, we take the five precepts or the five mindfulness trainings. And here in the Sangha, we recite them every month. So we have some support for that. And I think we can recite them quickly now and just pass if you're not into it. And we'll just do a call and respond just as a reminder of what they are and what we're inclining our hearts and our minds toward. And I'm going to offer them in Pali, and you can repeat back the Pali, and then you can repeat back the English. Mm. And if I was a better Buddhist, we would do some other chanting first. And I'm only the best timekeeper that I am, so we're not going to do that other chanting first. <laughs> but... <clears throat> uh. 
Anati Pata, where are my knees? Hikapadan, Samadhi Ami. Give it a try. Panati Pata, where are my knees? Hikapadan, Samadhi Ami. Adina Dana. Where are my knees? Where are the knees? Where are the knees? Samadhi Ami. Samadhi where are my knees? Where are my knees? Samadhi Ami. Oh. I'm not used to saying that one so I get myself out of sorts. Musawada. Musawada. Where are my knees? Where are my knees? Samadhi Ami. Sura. Sura. Maria. Maria. Mada Pamaratana. Mada Pamaratana. Maja Pamaratana. Where are my knees? Where are my Ami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living being. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any other being. Okay, so that's the first one, Anatipa. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not offered. I undertake the precept. To refrain from taking for that which is not offered. Adina dana. So that's that same dana that we talked about as an act of generosity or an offering. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the Kame Summa Chachara is I undertake the precept to refrain from misuse of sexual energy. I take the precept to refrain from the misuse of sexual energy. And then the fourth of Musawada is I undertake the precept to refrain from false or harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from false or harmful speech. And the fifth precept, I undertake the training, keeps changing the words, it's all the same. I undertake the training to refrain from consuming intoxicants that cloud the mind. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking intoxicants that cloud the mind. And that's Sarah Maria Maja Pramada time. Thank you for playing. So that's the, the second offering that the Buddha says. You know, if you're hanging out with people who are on the path, they're going to support you in holding your sila, holding your ethical conduct, whatever your ethical conduct might be. And as lay practitioners, if we've taken the step onto this path, following the precept is a great place to start. And again, in the public world, like that's what we start with. You receive a transmission of the five mindfulness trainings. And Theravada Buddhism, that's where you start, or you can. And insight, sometimes it comes a little bit later. People are trying to open the door a little bit more easily. But I find that practicing with those precepts, or even just using them as a guiding means, it doesn't mean that I don't stray. You know, shit happens. But it's like, oh, this brings freedom. This leads me to less suffering and toward liberation. Like this helps to ripen the fruit of that gloomy lotus. And the third thing that the Buddha offers in the sutta is wise speech. So it's not enough that wise speech is in the precepts, but it's lifted up again. And I read through the sutta today a couple of times, and he describes it in a lot of detail. And I'm sure that detail is useful, and I'll give you the number. You can look it up, and you can read it. But just to hold the impact of wise speech. And coming out of retreat, one of the things that was lifted up was a possibility of just playing with wise speech about these simple ways that we exaggerate things. 
really, really subtle. It's like, this is causing anyone any harm. No, no, probably not. But if we're practicing to attune to that, to notice that slightest mistruth, it's laying the foundation to free us from the bigger ones that are going to cause us more harm and suffering. And then the, the fourth, the fourth of these offerings is wise effort. And wise effort is often offered with four components. If we notice that we're having an unwholesome mind state, right? If some version of greed, aversion, or delusion is present, can we transform that? in some way. And you know, these practices can all apply in our meditation, but for me, I'm really holding them in how I'm navigating life, right? So there I am living my daily life, and today I had the thought arise, oh, you can't do anything right. It's like, it's such an old story. And there's enough practice and enough foundation that the wisdom is also there. It's like, oh yeah, hi there, Mara. Hi there, Mara, I see you, no big deal. And I don't believe it today. You know, maybe tomorrow I'll believe it again. <laughs> but it's like, oh yeah, there's that thought. And there isn't the spiraling down. It's like, oh, there's conditions. And there's enough wisdom in me to say, oh, are you having low blood sugar? Because that for me, that's often what's happening. There's there's some low blood sugar and I have this solution that I'm a piece of shit. I'm not perfect, I'm a human being. I'm not a piece of shit either. But that thought, it's so conditioned. So conditioned. You know, if you've been impacted by the family disease of alcoholism or by mental illness, you might have that conditioning too. <laughs> or if you just grew up in this world in this time, I don't know, you know, and don't think that I'm unique in some form of this language. But it's bullshit. It's delusion. And one of my teachers, Andrea Fella, she offered sometime before I went on retreat, and she was my guiding teacher on retreat also, but she offered sometime before I went on retreat this idea that, or I heard anyway, well, when there's a thought or a belief, there's delusion. If we're fixed, if we're caught by thought or belief, oh, delusion is present. I'm sure there are wholesome thoughts and beliefs, and maybe delusion isn't always present, but anyway, that idea landed for me. And so I can see more clearly now when I am caught on some idea Oh, hi, delusion, right? It's like, oh, that's freedom. It's like, that's a moment of freedom. That's a moment of freedom. And again, straight from the Buddha, he says that a spark of insight burns down a mountain or a heap of defilements. Right, so to just see, oh, mm, it's a game changer. So we can practice. So that when an unwholesome mindset arises, we can transform, and sometimes it's not so simple. It doesn't just transform like that. And so when we bring in a wholesome mind state or we broaden our attention, what else is here, right? What else is here? Much like I invite you to do as you come out of the stillness practice with our eyes closed, like what else is here? We can broaden our awareness or you can specifically practice to cultivate appreciation or gratitude or joy or delight or metta or something like we can do something concrete. So first, unwholesome mindset has arisen, transforming that. Second, an unwholesome mindset has not arisen. Great, how can we sustain that? By appreciating that an unwholesome mindset has not arisen. <laughs> and noticing what are the conditions to have freedom from an unwholesome mind state? Oh, right, I, I, I fed myself. I got enough sleep, I got an appropriate amount of exercise and stillness and balance and ease and like, Oh, I saw some people, or I took time for myself. Like, oh, these are the conditions. And then the second pair, bringing, bringing a wholesome mind state up, which is maybe not that different from the other two, but it has a different energy because it's not preceded by an unwholesome mind state. It's just like bringing a wholesome mind state up. How do we do that? Practicing in Sangha, practicing Metta, cultivating mindfulness. Mindfulness is a wholesome mind state. Tuning into what's here. And then when a wholesome mindset has arisen, appreciation, joy, gratitude, mindfulness, practicing to sustain it. 
And then we'll have to play with it more. We didn't get to talk about it tonight, but that's part of what I'm wanting to point to more in the formal practice these days is like mindfulness shows up. You notice. And even if you have an object that you're practicing with, you know, practicing with breath or sound or sensation in the body, you notice, oh, not there. And rather than like coming back, because for me, that experience of coming back is like, oh, it's doing something wrong. It's like this bad girl feeling in it. Instead of like coming back, it's like, oh, mindfulness is here. How does it feel that mindfulness is here? Can I get interested in that experience? Because the interest in that experience will help it have a little bit longer ride. And then the fifth, so those are the four of right effort. And then the fifth is anicca. Impermanence. If we continue to cultivate awareness of impermanence, then that alone can lead to full and complete liberation and freedom. And that is available anytime, any place. If we remember. Right? So again, it's a practice of remembering, which is another translation for sati, which you often call mindfulness or awareness. So I offer those five practices. Hopefully they might support you. And the recording will get posted and I'll write them out in the little write-up in case you want to um, collect them for yourself for later. Thank you so much for your, for your practice, for your time, for your care, for your attention. May the fruits of our practice be of benefit to all beings and bring peace and liberation. I think Tom has a few announcements and I'll offer one before he comes in. And that is that we have a guest teacher next week. My my friend and colleague and wonderful teacher, Fresh Lev White will be here holding the space. He's amazing, I love him. I hope that you'll come and get to soak in his Dharma. It's really fabulous and strong. And the theme will be love. And there's a write up on the calendar already. And if you show up, it will be really nice for me because I've asked him to come. And if there are people, if there are people here, I will feel better <laughs> about him being here. And then I'll be back next week. And I'm so glad to be back. So thank you so much. Okay.